Hi, this is Franz Cantor here, cartoonist, illustrator, and toon talker. And I'm here back again at the Australian Cartoon Museum, and I'm here, I'm joined here today with... Uh, Jim Bridges, and I'm the president of the Australian Cartoon Museum. Fantastic. And so here, here uh, we are in downtown Docklands. Yeah. Lockdown. Mm. So the subject of our... I'm doing another caricature today. We're doing another drawing, and it's going to be like a tutorial-style setup of... Uh, Understanding the process, I dropped a pencil. Um, no, you don't have to pick it up, it's a biro, don't use biros. You've got to pick up biros, God. Why, is it bad luck, is it? That's, of course, yeah. Today's subject uh, we're going to draw is uh, this fellow, which, uh, if you don't know this guy, his name is, we'll zoom over here, Clive James. So Clive James is an Australian journalist. Was. And filmmaker and TV present, presentator, prison personality. He died last year. Yeah, so he passed away last year of leukemia, I believe. So after a long sickness, this is him with with more more carpet. So a, sort of more, more carpet. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, a little bit of a shag pile there from the getting looking at the collars and things. It's definitely the seventies. Uh, so that would be a shag pile carpet. Um, this is in sort of more, more sort of a later hmm. version of him. So he's got quite a, you know, it's like a round head. It's it's a, you know, a potato, Mr. Potato Head. Um, very expressive uh, eyes, you could see. Hmm. I've done a little thumbnail, which I'll go over it with you in a, a second. A lot of people who, so, who caricature him um, have his eyes completely shut with a great big smile on his face. Hmm. So the it's yeah. interesting you talk about his eyes because very few people draw them. That's true. Yeah, he's got these sort of like they're pushed because his cheeks push up, right? Cheeks tend to push upwards like this into the eye area, so the eyes are uh, are pushed down also by the eyebrows. So when somebody was to squint, say, if they're you know um, uh, hit in the face by a bright light, then they, the, the, the idea is that these muscles close, help to close the eyes even further to block out anything you don't want to see. Hmm. Emotionally, this is a sort of a way of shy people usually trying to escape the public glare, you know, public uh, um, opinion or public eye. A lot of people in the public uh, area, like who, who are public speakers or actors or you know, personalities or something, they always suffer from um, complexes or shyness. And to over to push themselves, to overcompensate for that shyness, they get, go into an area where they're obviously in the spotlight. So it's kind of a weird uh, thing, isn't it? But it's a kind of a, a, a nice thing to think about the way that these muscles work to, you know, to, to integrate with the features of the face. Hmm. So it's a little thumbnail sketch I did, and obviously it's like a, we're looking, we're talking about a round shape, like an you know almost almost a perfect circle rather than an oval. But there's a little bit of vari variation we're going to try and get in there. So you're looking at a potato nose and a potato potato head with a potato nose, is um, the order of the day I think, which kind of looks like um, it's getting to be magooish <laughs> a little bit. But um, oh my George. <laughs> Mm. Well, Mr. Magoo is beautiful. Uh, we must we must draw uh, Jim Backus or Mr. Magoo one day. We must draw uh, Mr. Magoo, um, you know, because he's got such a lovely uh, Jim expression, Backus. lovely face. He was the father of um, James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. Uh, okay. So, right. Um, My God. I never saw it, it, Rebel Without a Cause. I don't know one with oh. a cause or without a cause. Well, you saw um, Gilligan's Island, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw, uh, actually, quite recently, I, I haven't seen Gilligan's Island before. I bought a what DVD was his name? set. What was his name? The character he played? Um, uh, Thurston Howell the Third, or something. That's right, Thurston Howell. Yeah. yeah. So, look at that. Isn't that sad? So we've, come, we've come to this. Uh, but, but you know, fret not, well, because use, guess what? I've got a handle. You can use that for little drawings. You can use that for little drawings. <laughs> you can't hold, can hardly hold this thing. Um, a lot of the time, one of my students pointed this out. 
to draw uh, roughly and lightly, you hold it like a violin bow. Isn't that nice? That's a kind of a nice little description of, of the pencil stroke uh, grip for, for a light and loose strokes. And then when you want to be um, more on point, then you change it to a traditional p pencil grip. Hmm, okay. So let's have a look at this uh, well, get stuck shape. Into of, get stuck I've, into it. I've taken liberty... I hope you don't mind. I've taken the liberty here to transpose this sketch idea of the thumbnail, which I usually do something quite loose to work out shapes. I've kind of attempted to put it onto well, the... Well, not uh, smiling. He's grouchy as buggery. On, on the tone paper. Um, well, he's, he, 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 I'm basing it on this picture, actually, which has got a little bit of teeth. Okay. So um, what do you know about Clive Jones? Uh, only that he's a TV personality and talked about uh, culture. So, you know, his show was a sort of a current affair comedy show um, talking about, you know, things that uh, um, popped up in the news or whatever. And um, he would just uh, make comment. So it was just a comedy show. That's, that's as far as I know. I know that he, he wrote books and magazine articles and things. He was a very learned uh, 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 man and um, went to England and uh, made his fortune. Well, he's a bit of a... Like Dick Whittington. <laughs> the streets are paved with gold in London, apparently. Um, he didn't have a cat. I don't think he didn't have a cat, no. Yeah, so... Where did Dick Whittington originally come from? From Whittington Downs. Oh, OK. And where the hell's that? No idea. Oh, OK. Okay. Um, it was just one of those stories that, like Puss in Boots, you know, it's like a, mm. it has some moral, but no, one's, no one remembers what the damn moral is all about. Be I happy with what you have, you eating porridge. Enjoy your porridge. Okay, well. You lowly let's, uh, ground in his, dweller. In his, in his lifetime, yeah. um, this, this polymath of uh, popular culture. Wow, that's a, that's a uh, mouthful. He produced 16 books of poetry. Four novels, five memoirs, mm. of which his first one, Unreliable Memoirs, which is probably um, his, the his, best. Um, yeah. and uh, 24 non-fiction books, mostly comprised of reviews and essays. Mm -hmm. um, and all that comes roughly to about 50 books in a lifetime, which is not bad for a, a bloke who was a television presenter. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess it's just food for um, thought. Anyway, he's born in Sydney in 1939, and he died in 2019 last year. Yep. He was uh, uh, christened Vivian Leopold James. Right, and Vivian. Vivian, yeah, and of course... 1939, the year he was born, that's the year that um, Vivian Gone with the Wind came out, yeah? Right, so he's named after Vivian Lee. No, well, the point is, uh, no one heard of Vivian Lee until the film came out, and then everybody knew about it, so... Um, that's why he, he left the country. He begged, he begged to get his name changed. Right. Did so, it work? Yeah, of course. Um, and he named after some character in a film, which I can't remember... So, of course, you know, um, so he picked John his, Wayne's he picked name was name. Marion. Yeah, well, yeah, but, I mean, how many, I mean, there's a hole. There's a hole. Isn't that like that song, there's you know, the, the boy named Boo or something? No, what was Sue. it? Sue. Sue. The boy named Sue? Yeah. Um, yeah, but... So it toughens um, you up by being called a girl's name? Is that the whole idea? Kicking in the girls in the mud and the blood and the beer. Yeah, well, what could I do? <laughs> no, I don't think it's the same. No, anyway, the so... Same. Don't you think um, it's the same? He was a literary critic, he was a TV critic, he was a journalist, he was a broadcaster on television and radio and the internet, he was a poet, a satirist, um, yeah, and a writer and God knows what else he did. Mm. Um, anyway, he... Um, um, so sort of like the Renaissance man. Yeah, yeah, he was. Jack of yeah. all trades. So w he went to um, university in Sydney and mm. he wrote for the... University magazine, uh, what was it? You mean the Sydney University or yeah, the New South Wales? Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, University of New South Wales or the Probably. Sydney Probably. Um, I don't know about Sydney. <laughs> okay. it's, a, <laughs> it's up there somewhere. No one knows about Sydney. Yeah, um, yeah, so he wrote for 
uh, Honi Soy, so, Honi Soy, which is a um, a newspaper for the main University of Sydney, mm -hmm. and he directed, you know, um, student reviews, mm -hmm. and he got a BA in arts, um, mm -hmm. and then he worked as a journalist for the Sydney Morning Herald before he went over to England, mm -hmm. and he shared a flat with Bruce Beresford, the Australian film director. Mm -hmm. And he was a neighbour of uh, Brett Whiteley, and also um, he knew Barry Humphreys, the, the, all the Australians hanging around London at the time. Right. The 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 Australian push. The push. The push, yeah. Right. This is P-U-S-C-H. It's a German word. Yeah. It's what Hitler did, the push. Oh, he pushed and he pushed and he pushed, yeah. Mm. Actually, Hitler wanted peace. Sure, he, he wanted did. a piece of this and a piece of that and a piece of this. Yeah, that's more like it. And he pushed for more, yeah. Anyway, um, so um, he did all sorts of jobs before he sort of found his niche and he even worked as a circus um, rastabout for about 12 months. That's an unusual uh, trade for somebody in the 60s. Um, Circuses. Well, circuses are big in uh, Europe, aren't they? I don't know about England. Oh, they yeah, maybe. Well, they actually have main... Like in Australia, they just have... They set up tents and there's the circus, but they have buildings for circuses. In I Europe. only know Don Amici's Moscow Circus. Don Amici. It wasn't Don Amici's... <laughs> he was the presenter. Yeah, on that... Hey, have circus. a look at this idiot. What was the show the... called? What was the show called? I don't know. Greatest Show on Earth? No, I don't. No, what was it? Circus World or something? What I was it called? No, that was a movie. They used to play that. Dun, 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 yeah, that's it. Dun, 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 no, all the time. I remember that. Yeah. Anyway, um, so um, he went to Cambridge. You heard of Cambridge, haven't you? Uh, well, it's better than going to Coventry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, where where he, you know, he, he was rubbing shoulders with Germain Greer and mm. Eric Idle and Simon Shamer. Sh Mm -hmm. Simon Shamer is a, uh, a historian and he does all these BBC shows about um, the history of uh, um, the Jews and, um, and, and art programs about artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he did his PhD on Shelley, the poet. All right. And anyway, he became the first TV critic in England. So uh, on, for Observer... The Observer um, paper, and um, he got stuck into things, and he was very funny because that's the whole point about. Um, he, he he brought with him that Australian larrikin humour, which made him stand out in England. You know. Yeah, because um, they'd never seen that before, I guess. Well, they did, but they liked it. it the Brits liked the Australians. <laughs> yeah, it fits they, into their their um, programming. Yeah, when I was in England, um, we stayed at this really dive, and this bloke who was in charge of the dive, he was really he liked Australians, mm. and he made us. Uh, he didn't like Americans, he didn't like uh, French people, but he loved Australians. He made me and my wife feel really comfortable, but uh, everybody else had to beg him to turn the bloody hot water on and everything like that. And he told me, he said, he was po he was positive that all Australians um, are born comedians. Right. But I just think we're. Um, um, that's a very interesting... Um, I think Australians are shy. And, that's interesting. And they just crack jokes before someone else cracks a joke against them. That's what I think. Right. Anyway, so um, his, his reviews are hilarious, but he also got stuck into people. He tore strips off them, you know. Mm. And he wrote basically in those years extensively for most major magazines and papers in Australia, US and Britain. Mm. And uh, he also, during the 70s, wrote... Songs with someone called Peter Atkin. Oh yeah, and they they did albums, they toured and everything. Um, and uh, and like you know, um, he started up all these television programs about culture, uh, and uh, like he did postcards uh, where he drop he he go over to another country. He'd go to Miami or he'd go to yeah. Hollywood or he'd go to um, uh, Munich or something like that. And he'd hire the local car, the German car or the American car, and yep. drive around himself. And he'd, he'd send up, but he'd, he'd put himself as a, like, for instance, when he went to Hollywood, mm. um, he goes through the whole process of becoming a star. What do you have to do to be a star in Hollywood? Yeah, he did one in Bollywood. 
You yeah, do yeah. it in Hollywood. Yeah, and he does that. And so he I goes saw, to a. I he, saw what he did in Bollywood. He was yeah. an extra in a Bollywood uh, action film. And he, <laughs> like, because he knows a lot of people, like, for instance, um, Dud, Dudley Cook was uh, yep. r- running a bar in, in, in um, Los Angeles somewhere. All right. So because they're all mates, he sticks him in the show, you know? Mm. And he goes for a rest at this bar, and of course it's run by. Is this somebody yeah. who shouldn't be in charge of a bar, Dudley Cook? Um, why? Well, I'd give him 10 out of 10, personally, keep, for that sort of thing. Keep him away the, from the product. Yeah. Anyway, um, um, yeah, but I, was, I, I think he, that's why he ended up with the... Because he's a, he's a celebrity. And, I'm you know, thinking Peter drug- Cook. So it's not Peter Cook. You're I, talking about no, Dudley Moore. Did Dudley say, Moore. Yeah, Dudley Moore, not Peter Cook. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's what I was saying, Sorry, D- Dudley. Yeah. I got the right group but the wrong person, but yes, yeah. absolutely, you should keep him away from the liquor cabinet. Um, yeah, so um, he did all these shows which were really popular and, of course, they're funny. Yeah. And, like, he, he would go to... Um, he would interview uh, sex workers and all sorts of people, unusual people that, that you don't normally... Because, like, he'd go to the red light district in um, Germany or something like that. In and Holland. He, yeah, all these, yeah, uh, and you know, the window girls or something in Holland. Yeah, he'd interview them and stuff like that, and talk about the, you know, like he he'd actually do things for uh, uh, the color of the town, you know, what what it's famous for. So he'd go for those things. Yeah, so they're not like exposés like Louis Thoreau or something. No, they're no, very no, no. But I, I, I reckon entertainment. I reckon that Louis, Louis Thoreau sort of bounced off what he started personally, you know. Yeah, and of course he had all these. Um, he hosted lots of um, um, semi-serious uh, uh, literary things on, um, and cracked lots of jokes, and had lots of celebrities, and you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and he wrote his five memoirs, which are really popular. This, and uh, he was on Saturday Night Clive. They called it Saturday Night Clive instead of Saturday Night Live, like in America. Yeah. And that was popular, and it had yeah. all sorts of. His mates and different people he knew. Mm. He'd, he'd mix up sort of uh, TV celebrities with literary people and all that sort of stuff, you know. Mm. And then it, that became Sunday Night Clive. Mm. And, you know, it shows called Clive James on television. Actually, that pictures, I think that's what it says, that, on, that picture you showed before. Mm. Yeah, so, um, and he did a whole series on fame, I remember. Like yeah. fame in the, the 80s. Fame in the 60s, mm. and he sort of um, strip mine what was popular during that time and who was fame. Who so was famous. he's a cultural commentator. Yeah, and he'd be analysing the concept of fame. Yeah, you know, um, which were really interesting. And he was good at it because he had a good sense of humour and timing. Yeah, and was able to most of the idea, like he's pleased as punch to be there, but most of the content, and the funny bits, were in the. Um, uh, the, the the over what do you call it the dialogue over the, over the track and this summing up at the end of the story. Well, there were people like um, oh, like what's her name, um, Catherine Hepburn, mm. who wouldn't be interviewed by people. Very rarely was she interviewed, mm. but uh, he got to interview her because you know of his reputation. You know, mm. because he's sort of like this wisecracking Australian. Um, uh, 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 intellectual, but you know he's got his fingers in all these pies, you know. Right. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, and he, he did radio, and he did the internet. Mm. He had a show on the internet called Talking in the Library, <laughs> where he'd have all these people he knew, uh, Australian authors and um, famous people he he just talked to because he he could. So was that in a library? No, but it's called talking the library because I mean you're not allowed to talk in the library, are you? You know that's that's what it was called. Right. Talking the library, and he had podcasts. He did podcasts. He did all that stuff. Yeah. But um, the world knows him as a wisecracking Australian sort of fat guy, you know. And mm-hmm. I was a little bit embarrassed with his humour, being an Australian. I just thought it sort of stuck out too obvious. You thought it was telling the English too much about our culture and what we laugh at and uh, no, no, how just, silly we but, are. You know, just the cringe, you know, the cultural cringe. But also he was a bit of a... He, 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 was, um, uh, he was a ladies' man and when he'd interview a, a, a famous woman, he'd go silly. He'd just 
drool all over the place. <laughs> and that's, it was embarrassing for me, you know, to watch him. Oh, okay. Anyway, he's very witty, and um, like for instance, he's talk like he's 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 got all these famous sayings. He said like um, describing Arnold Schwarzenegger. He called him uh, a brown condom full of nut- walnuts. Uh, yeah, that's a reference to um, Michelangelo. Actually, that was somebody in the Middle Ages. Someone, another famous artist, was interviewed. Did they have condoms about... in the Middle Ages? It wasn't a reference to condoms. It was a reference to stockings filled with. Oh, marks. okay, okay. Well, um, yeah, because and, and Michelangelo he's used just to updated paint. it. He's just updated it. Yeah. Well, he appropriated it, and yeah. yeah. And Barbara Cartland, that famous uh, British writer oh, the of love and stuff. stories and mm. poodle. No, no, pugs. She had pugs. Pugs. Didn't she? Did she? I, like, don't pugs know. Or I can't poodles. remember. Anyway, she used to write a, a love story every two weeks or something. Mm. Turn them out. He called her um, "Twin Miracles of Mascara." Her eyes looked like the corpses of two small crows that had crashed into the white cliffs of Dover. Mm. And he called Yasser Arafat Yasmin Arafat, you know. Yasmin. And he talked about uh, snooker. And he called it chess with balls. Mm. And um, and uh, he was a famous atheist, although he didn't go around promoting it. But um, mm. when he was asked about his religious beliefs, he said... Um, all religions are advertising agencies for a product that doesn't exist. Mm. And all those, all those... And he's fluent in French, German, Italian, Spanish, Russian, Japanese, English, and even Australian. Wow. Yeah. That's a gift. That's something really... So he was, he was quite a polymath Imagine. when it came to uh, culture. Mm. So I guess that reflected in the, in the topics and the... Um the, the angles that he'd take for the, you know, for the articles, for the, the interviews and the articles and things. So he'd have like a multi-point of view. Well, in those, um, in those, in those, uh, like those Melbourne Tonight shows and all those sort of shows, David Letterman, they always stand up and tell a whole bunch of jokes. Well, he did the same thing, but he, he did it sitting down um, like a newsreader and mm. he, he'd write all his own scripts and they're just full of all sorts of... Um, corny puns and, and some brilliant witticisms, you know. Mm. But I, I, you know, I felt a bit embarrassed watching him a lot because um, he, he was just... Um, he just Gushy. Go, he'd go silly With when he was a woman, when he was interviewing a woman or something. He'd just go silly. He'd yeah. just sort of um, just go all gooey, like melted butter in the sun, you know. Right. <laughs> oh, well, maybe he was sort of, you know, fascinated by women, like... Uh... But you know, he, he's a breath of fresh air to um, to England, you know. That's and he came up with all these great ideas, you know. And obviously, the, the, they still follow some of those ideas, you know. Mm. I yeah. remember when he when he goes to Hollywood, he's um, yeah. All those things are actually on online. Um, all you can check them all out. Some of those shows. Yeah. Um, Clive and James. When on he television. went to Hollywood, he goes to an agent. And says what do I have to do to be famous and all that sort of stuff and yeah. um, he sort of it's but it's, he's setting it all up at the same time and, and then he goes to a gym a special bloke who trains people before movies and yeah. he gets him to do sit ups and and of course he's out of out of out of um, shape totally out of shape big stomach on him and all that sort of stuff but he's prepared to strip down and do all these sort of semi naked exercises for the camera and then he gets doled up to go to a uh, uh, some sort of fundraiser and he gets uh, doled up as an American uh, cowboy and he looks absolutely pathetic and stupid but you know he still goes along with it you know mm. so I was you know it was very impressive being an Australian I think most people like Australians they just think we're so you know, easy going and yeah and, and like they were years ago you know the Americans I've met like 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 um, like Australians because we used to be like you people yeah, uh-huh. obviously before the rot set in. The the rot. The rot set in. Yeah. Okay. Urban sophistication. So the Americans are too sophisticated. Oh yeah. Too oh, jet yeah. Oh, yeah. and oh yeah. Hobnobby and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, culture that the things that uh, he reflected on, pop culture and culture in general, they had a very um, his roundup at the end of the sh- of the of the talk at the end of the show or whatever would kind of point out that you know 
Um, it, it, of all the silly things that that he's, you've just seen um, uh, in you know in the people and the the careers and all of this stuff that he's just uh, uh, shown, there is an ultimate um, goodness in you know the um, in I guess the the individual. Um, striving for success, like to do a Bollywood, you wouldn't think it was so hard to do, to be a Bollywood actor, you know, or to do a Bollywood line or an, or an uh, extra role in in a, in a Bollywood movie. And of course, it's he, he proved that it's harder than he thought it would be, um, which is funny, right? But it's also in a way, it's it's like he went there to learn, and he learned that, um, you know, that that. Uh, it was harder than than he thought, and um, it's not something that you would immediately think that uh, there's an art to it. But there is. There's an art to those things. So it's kind of he's not making fun of the people. He's not making fun of um, Barbara Cartland. He's not making fun of Barbara Cartland. You know, you either find her funny or find her, you know. Um, boring, but the fact is that somebody that pours her whole life, every waking moment, into this uh, product, into this, these books, you know, I think it, it proved that uh, there's, there's something about it that people love it. There has to be a reason why people love it. It must be something there. And this is why his journalism had that kind of, in, you know, true investigative properties. Yeah, without having, it, without drawing sides or, or classless, snide. like classless. He it, was, he well, was, yeah, but not just classless. But you know, when you have a, like, you have an impression immediately. Well, this is going to be funny because of such and such, and then you think, well, that is funny. But you know what? There's, there's, she's a nice lady anyway. There's kind of humanity there. Yeah. And the same thing with the Bollywood directors. You wouldn't think that they're like, you know. Is there art here? Is there craft here? Well, yeah, there is. You, you didn't think about it, but there is. But there's a whole... I mean... And this is why people loved him. Of, there's a whole stack of culture wrapped up in it as well. Yeah, besides... people loved him because he proved that, um, you know, these things that we take for granted, that we laugh at, you know, these cultural cringe things, these, mm. uh, you know... Um, Things uh, that that we make fun of, um, and other, and of course, people like them. Uh, people follow them, but we're dismissing them. And he's he, it's like we're taking another look through his eyes. And he had the intelligence to to uh, you know speak in a, in a way and an honest. Um, of an honest opinion. Well, a perfect example of what you're saying is, on, is, is um, him writing about television. They yeah. didn't think writing about television was worthwhile. Exactly, yeah. And because he comes from another culture and he wants to fit in there somewhere, he says, well, you know, um, all, all, the, um, all the other... Well, I can draw you another, ten, another um, analogy here. I can draw you another analogy. Keep with, drawing, keep with, drawing. Yeah. yeah. Um, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol used to draw um, popular culture. And icons, Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, Elizabeth Taylor, mm -hmm. and also famously soup cans, you know. But what, what's so interesting about soup cans? Well, through Andy's eyes, soup cans are art. And through Clive's eyes, you know, these people are wonderful. They're, they're very interesting people. And this is why Clive was so important, um, as a journalist, you know, as a thinker, as a speaker, mm. uh, as a human being, because it's sort of like, uh, you know, we're, we're taking another look at people. Don't just make, just to have a, an opinion based on, on what other people say or think about it. You know, like if he was looking at the, at something that's obviously, you know. Uh, people make fun of the Kardashians because they're commercial or whatever like that. But he would take a different stance and, and investigate them. Well, people like them. Why do they like them? There's well, he'd something want to find out. It. He'd so, want to go to the exactly. source. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And that's, this is what you need. You need a, like an honest evaluation. Well, that's what I meant when I said he this was sort of really... classless because the reason people wouldn't bother to that because, oh, no, that's, that's, that's beyond the pile, that stuff, you know. Well, yeah, but soup but, cans. But, What's interesting yeah, about soup cans? But, but he, he, wouldn't, he was sort Same. of classless in a sense because he came from another culture. Very different, Exactly. You know? Well, Warhol came from Poland. He was a, like a Polish He culture. started his career as a... Um, as a commercial, a commercial artist, artist. Yeah. and he was drawing not soup cans no not soup but he was drawing Fashion. handbags and yeah. shoes and accessories and stuff like that yeah. yeah so but that's because he was skilled he was a skilled commercial artist yeah yeah um so that just reflected his 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 abilities but his interests his passions were culture and clive's passion is culture you know then in many ways they should kind of share that uh yeah, but I mean, yeah, it was so the culture of New York just, in, um, in particular, a, a, a time and place, whereas Clive James went all over the place. Yeah. You know? And uh, he, he, he'd want to find out um, what really goes on on the other side of the, the, the wall, you know, in, in Germany and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. Oh, did he do one of those about the, the, iron, the iron Curtain? I'm... I, well, I, I, I think he did, actually. Mm. Um, yeah, because um, <laughs> he, he said, this is the car that they drive. I don't know what it was, a Skoda or something. I can't remember what it was. Mm. And he hires the, the car at, for his hotel. And he, he talk about the hotel. He talk about the, the, you know, the, the bedding and things like that and all that sort of stuff. So he'd give you sort of on the, on the ground level. And then he'd be interviewing... Like a Yelp... The, yeah, he, then he'd be interviewing the a Yelp rating. Well, yeah, and so at this his car, Yelp for rating instance, would be very long. The car, the car, <laughs> the car like he Yelp hired rating. became a running joke because yeah. of driving, and then it and it'd break down, break down, and take you know, it'd make all these noises and stuff. And yeah, they'd have him um, this tiny little car that he could just get himself into, mm. and they'd have a camera in there, and um, the noise it was making, and of course, it would stop and all that sort of stuff. And he just incorporated that into the experience of going to um, uh, East Berlin. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Fascinating. So he's, um, you know, so he, he was would, a he, he, he would check out all the, he of... would check out all the, he would check out all the, the, the places that, the places that different places are famous for, but he'd also check out the other things, Not you know. Not so famous. Yeah. But also, um, you know, the things that the other shows didn't show. Because like these postcard shows you have on television, they're just to um, flog your tourism. Yeah. That's basically what they put. But he's interested, generally interested, in, in, in why the East Germans are different to the West Germans. Yeah. You know? And, you know, he's a culture vulture. He's really interested in what makes people tick with their culture. Well, yeah, but a lot of good stories come from that uh, technique that, that he had, that sense of honesty. Yeah, that sense of honesty. That's why people like to be interviewed. Catherine Hepburn liked to be interviewed by him because he had a sense of, you know, uh, uh, he, I mean, apart from gushing, but he had a, a sense of um, honesty. So whatever whatever he's going to say is going to be backed by his... his. Well, he wasn't afraid to, um, as I said, he wasn't afraid to strip off to, down, down to his... Um, Undies to do exercises in Hollywood or whatever, yeah, that, or, or, well, that's or to go honesty. bathing that's, in the in the red. Delusional. <laughs> it's so silly. No, but you know, I'm saying, it, um, and he'd always put himself as the like, especially around women. I, it used to be so embarrassing because he 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 he'd be pretending to be a sexy person, and of course, obviously not. And then so he'd be flirting. Yeah, he flirted a lot. Yeah, but. Um, uh, it was never reciprocated, you know. Mm. But so I, it was kind of I think, embarrassing. I think, yeah, it was. I, f I, f that, I found him really. slightly embarrassing, but I mean, he's a brilliant man. Yeah, brilliant man, and his background. I mean, hit the core, the core of the man was poetry. Right. So he's responding to all these different things he sees all around him. You know yeah. what I mean? All this crazy cultural stuff that's different in different cultures, and. Mm. You know, and I think he'd be interested in universality, trying to you know see the universality in all these sort of travels he did. Mm. Universe, universal themes, universal mm. concepts. Yeah. 
It's funny, uh, the, you know, like a, he had a it was postcards, he called it postcards. It was more like a, a journey from within, a journey about him learning. Well, that's about right. These that's exactly right. Rather than the, the place itself, you know? Well, both. You got both. Yeah. But you, as you said, you'd be learning something that you wouldn't get from yeah, a normal. That's right. I mean, the normal know, documentary on West, West Germany, he would, he'd be talking about how the cars don't work and. And he'd yeah. physically show you that. Whereas, I mean, um, there, a lot of people have gone to a place like North Korea. Yeah. And, and they've and sort and of. Some talk- of them even came back. <laughs> yeah. In one piece. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, if he went there, I think he did go there. Yeah. Um, I don't. I think he did put, put a, 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 a show up. But he, he, he. I mean, the usual thing is they turn the electricity off at six o'clock and all that <laughs> sort of stuff. Yeah. To save and, you know. People are hungry and all that sort of stuff. But well, they have to be, share the electricity, don't he'd they? He'd always be looking for the humour, and if there was no humour, he'd sort of bring it out himself. You know what I mean? Mm. He, so he'd, he'd look at situations from a, a, a perspective. His perspective, like the um, the guy that doesn't like or doesn't understand pomp and circumstance and stuff. So he would, you know, make uh, he would he would tell a story from that point of view. So if something was funny about something and he found it funny, he'd relate that. And you, because, you know, it's a universal experience. It's almost like a childlike innocence in a way. Where you're not sort of, um, your worldview is not tempered by what you've read in books only. It's it's by the day-to-day experience of, uh, yeah. of living. Yeah. And this is, this is something that, um, you know, is incredibly valuable from a point of view because it, it reinforces the the um, specialness of each one of us, and um, when you look at someone like Clive's postcards, when you look at his stories and his uh, interviews and things like that, they're, they're from a very um, truthful point of view. So it's very much um, based on you know um, his love of the land or his love of the character or his you know genuine sense of inquiry but but he could deliver at the high end of culture as well like for instance well, yeah. he did a radio um program with an australian poet porter mm. and they did the history of poetry and i thought it was one of the best things i've ever heard on radio ever history of poetry yeah the history of poetry and yeah. they, they analyze romantic poets and individual Poems and stuff like that, and yeah, well, it's, and, and it's because they're both well. poets, mm. uh, Porter and, and and James are both poets. Mm. They sort of talked about their personal experience of poetry and what they like and how they write and all that sort of stuff in comparison to all this historical stuff, you know. Yeah, the Shelleys and the the um, you know the Byrons um, and the Byrons and the um, 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 Emily Dickinsons and the you know Robert Frosts and, and the Ogden Nashes. Oh, Ogden Nash. Oh. So um, the uh, <laughs> the Ogden Nash. You like that, folks? How I threw that one. I like that, that one. Yeah. <laughs> what um, do you know about Ogden Nash? Well, I love lo- nonsense. He he put out he put out a didn't he put out a book called the Left Handed Dictionary? Yeah. Yeah, it's full of funny things. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, there's a lot of. Um, Interesting quotes and anecdotes and quips and gags and and observations. So you know when people observe something observational, they call it observational humor. It is a, in a way um, finding something funny and the painfully obvious. Usually in something we've taken for granted all along. Suddenly someone says the emperor has no clothes. Ha ha! Mm. Finally, you know somebody realizes this and. Uh, and uh, points it out. Well, he's like that. It's kind of that observational humour that has that level of truth and and um, uh, conviction. The viewers watching this can't see the fact that you're just um, taking um, your information from two separate photos. Well, look here. I'll, I'll show it to you. Here we go. Here's his head's cut off here, right? And so this one, his head's not cut off. So I'm kind of looking. Where's the hair gone? Well, there it is. And uh, there's a lot of um, that... Mm. Building up of uh, of information that I'm trying to to sort of catch. 
I'm, I'm not convinced I have him 100% nailed down here uh, as far as the likeness is concerned, but you know what? I'm very interested in the textures and things, and I've been very uh, quiet in, in, in terms of um, speaking about the process here. But it's a very interesting. There's a lot of different areas of shine and texture. Texture is a very interesting thing to catch with a pencil. Especially, you've got a white pencil, a brown pencil, a black pencil. So you've got like equal opportunity to to show, you know, um, different kinds of uh, texture, uh, highlights and and shadows, and uh, you know, build up a three dimensional construction in a way. Even though it's a pencil, it's a humble pencil, but it helps. You know, this this simple these simple items: the brown pencil, terracotta. Um, in this case, a Prismacolor. The white pencil, another Prismacolor. It's a soft pencil. Um, a little bit harder pencil is a is a black Polychromo. So those three t t together, perhaps with a, a, ha a help with a brush pen, and uh, I'm going to be using probably a, a white paint marker, which just just kicks up the white a little bit. You know, mm. some white spots. I'll show you exactly what it does. Got a double reflection happening in. I don't know whether it's the glasses or the, the build-up of um, the cheek. moisture in the eyes, but you've got two points here, which are very dramatic. So just looking at where they are in the photograph and how important they are um, in that dark shadow, he's got this sort of tear um, effect. So what happens with the, the pressure or the tension of the face um, also happens with emotions, I guess, too, which you can't really have much of a control over. Um, the, uh, uh, the face, the muscles push, squeeze the eye. They squeeze the eye. You've got this push of muscles coming up and muscles coming down to squeeze the eye. A lot of people that are um, subject to working in the sun or have, uh, you know, um, uh, shyness or something, they tend to squeeze, their face squeezes their features. It's almost like, you know, uh, trying to hide the features in a fist. The whole face becomes like a fist and it gets really, really tight. Um, the more light it is, the more embarrassed they are. You know, they get very, very tight. The, the, the muscles are pushing like, like a fist itself. Um, and uh, this is something that you, you kind of sense when you're drawing it. You say, why is that so tight? It's because he's shy. Or it's because he's uncomfortable with the public gaze. And yet the public's gazing, and he's the one that attracted that gaze. So there's a sort of a, a double whammy there. Is it like a... Well, he definitely put himself out there, didn't he? Yeah. In so many embarrassing situations. Um, look, that's something I want to talk to you about. You've mentioned it. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean you're an, uh, you're an extrovert. What I'm trying to say is it, it could actually mean the opposite. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things you, you mentioned in this series mm. um, that. Um, this is my Clive James series. <laughs> well, there you are. That's your. Um, my uh, postcards. You, you said that if you. If you lose the the the, the likeness, mm. um, it's still a good drawing. It is because do, it's do, you, do you want to actually expand on that? Okay, well, look, uh, because uh, it's experience. You mean it's just experience? It's, it is. That's that's true. It is an experience. It's practice. But the the, the main thing is that um, this is a very personal uh, expression of Clive James. You know, and it's my exploration of all of these features that I'm I'm appreciating and and studying. You know, and I get I get it while I'm working. I get this feeling that you know there is something beyond the expression, beyond the likeness itself, which kind of resonates with me. And that's the feeling of uncomfortableness in the public gaze and the public stare. And uh, you know, it, it's a very um, relatable. I think experience, we can all feel that way. Some days we don't want to get out of bed. We don't want to go to work. We don't want to go to school. We don't want to do this. We don't want to, because we don't want to, we don't want people looking at us. We want to be left alone. I want to be alone. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, but, you know, you this know, is an, an, a, a, a relatable experience for people. 
Yes, but the point is, with a caricature, like if you draw a horse yeah. or you draw a house, as you said, you get you get it's your and impression you of get it. You get a hundred artists, you get a hundred horses. And you may get a hundred yeah. different. But you know, when totally it comes different. to drawing something like a caricature, mm. if you don't know who it is, mm. and you're supposed to know who it is, no, it doesn't make any difference. Yeah, well, I mean, but the actual artist feels like he's failed because no. most people who don't get the likeness feel it's failed. Because no. I know this because I've seen them chuck the, pi the picture in the bin. Really? Yeah. Well, I, get, I wouldn't chuck it in the bin. Look, everything you draw is, a, is a, a lesson in the decisions that you make as you, as you go along. So you're saying that if, if you didn't get the likeness, at least um, uh, appreciate what, what you've learned in the process. You have that, learned a lot. There's a hell of a lot. Yeah, yeah. that's it. And so focus, focus on that, not not the failure, because this people... Failure is a point of view. It's not, <laughs> ah, it's not well, real. Anyway, failure is a point of view. Just change your why damn the point philosophers, of view. Why don't the philosophers say that? How can they, they rely upon a next Sydney, well, I'm shocked Sydney that they artist do, like you, you know, to come out with that, you know? I'm, I'm surprised that they don't. I don't understand why, why people are f so fixated on failure... And in a caricature or a portrait, why are you so fixated on on I the think, likeness think, of the person? I of, think getting back to this know, guy, you've done something was in reference to. He was prepared to do stuff. He, I mean, he, you see, he had he had the foundation. He had classical education, hmm. um, and that taught him a lot, right? And then he goes out and looks at the world, and he sort of um, compares all these things. But he was prepared to put himself on the line. To be like like a, a social experiment mm. in testing these um, cliches about different cultures and, and countries, mm. you know. Yeah. So, uh, well, I'm is just that saying. A question or a no, statement? I'm just saying. So he, he kaboom. <laughs> Where's the kaboom? Where's the question? No, but I'm just saying that. Um, uh, I mean, basically, you're saying that all life is is a, is a lesson. And, yeah, it's an experience. And, and this stuff about failure, well... Well, I mean, what's that Aussie expression? You wouldn't be dead for quids. Yeah. What's you that you tell you? wouldn't be dead for quids, no. Yeah. You wouldn't. Depends on so how you, many quids. You, you can't get the quids anymore, as the goons would say. You can't get the quids anymore, no. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's a very interesting character, and I'm finding this uh, as I'm drawing. You know, there's a lot of the... Um, well, it's like Barry Humphreys is similar. Barry Humphreys is a similar sort of character, mm. except he's much more uh, outgoing and, um, you know, like he, <laughs> he sort of shoots barbs at everybody. Mm. Um, uh, he had an American show, but he doesn't really go over well in America, but in England they loved him. And I'm just thinking because the, the British are much more sort of... Um, they're shy and they're sort of... They, they you know, they, they hold yeah. back, where the Americans are uh, much more sort of... Aggressive and, and show offy sort of culture, but but um, this Australian guy, Could be. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think that that's why he lived in England for most of his life. Mm. He stuck out like um, dogs doovers, you know, over there. <laughs> yeah, it's another. I like Auss I like Aussie the hair coming off the top of his uh, head. Yeah, it's a nice. Um nice it's um sort of wind <laughs> as as billy Connolly would say it's wind, windswept and interesting yeah so he's very uh, windswept it, and interesting it could be a, a it could be a close-up our miyazaki yeah. movie you know mm. if it moved yeah so you know i'm looking at at the individual elements and textures and things like that mm. i have i would if I was doing this again, I'd kind of tend to push more from the cheeks up into the face. Um, I think that would be would be a, the right thing to do with uh, with his likeness. It's interesting what you're doing with this because most caricatures that the the, the ACM have of this bloke, he's very he's, jowly. Yeah. yeah, but he's like a football. He's blown out football, like yeah. really round so the, the and equal puffy space cheeks, you know, above the and, you're, and below. You're, you've chopped off this sort of section of the face, you know, yeah. so that's interesting. Well, I, want, I, I was concerned that I, the expression that I was after was the, you know, looking um, shyly almost uh, under the, the, um, the glasses, 
um, in many ways. So I'm kind of like conscious of. I, I think you. I think that, you're right uh, because when I saw him on television and expression. I felt embarrassed looking at him, it's because he put himself in embarrassing situations. Yeah. And it's not like he was loaded down with confidence. No. You know what I mean? So that's another reason why I sort of admired him. And I think the Brits admired him for that reason as well. Yeah, so, you know, you don't... Um, you, you, you take, you know, get stripped down to a bathing costume or something and you look silly. Um, but you're not meant to look good. You're, you're meant to look silly. You're meant to look vulnerable. So it's that vulnerability, I think, that makes a good journalist. Because well, it's like... I mean, people... You don't know the story. You don't have an opinion... Yeah. yeah, you're forming an opinion, and that's why you're here. And this, this is the same with me. I, I don't know him. I don't have an opinion. And I'm finding an opinion. I'm forming an opinion by finding it on the paper. So I don't have any preconceived idea of what he should be, of what he shouldn't be, you know, whether it be maybe be more jowly or something like that. And uh, less... In, you know, space at the top, things like that. I'm not sure. I just don't know. Do but you think you've got him? I've got a certain aspect of him, yeah. I think I've got some of his uh, personality. Um, as I said, I think the angle probably uh, would have been more served to have more of a feeling of pushing up from below. So you get more area down here. Mm. more yeah. area down here would give you more space to yeah. push those yeah. eyes yeah. up and even to make them even smaller see what I did with this it's like uh, or even even more expand any more expanded like this so you get this effect of pushing up uh, to making that squinty eye expression I think is uh, pretty important uh, let's just uh, just uh, finish this down here with a I'm conscious of going crooked with the. Oh, you've got a these lines. You've got a right-handed bias there. I do. Oh yeah, it's obvious. Oh, this is not real. This is made up. Right-handed bias, indeed. So you know, he died last year, as we said, uh, and. Well, um, actually, he had cancer. Had cancer for a long time. Yeah. And uh, he did an ABC show where they, they brought up the subject. Mm. And because he, he lived longer than he expected, he, he apologised for not dying a few times. <laughs> right. But he, he didn't live that... He, he didn't make that... Uh, no, but, uh, like, I think he, like he, he knew for eight seven eight. years he was going to mm. cark it. Mm. And he actually came out and I remember about... Five years ago, everybody was talking about Clive James is going to die. Clive James is going to die. You know, it was in the news, you know. Mm. And everyone said, I didn't know he was still alive. Well, not necessarily. Um, and the other thing is, um, they did a uh, 60 Minutes in Australia, did a, a, some sort of a story about um, this woman who apparently said she's had an affair with him for the last 10 years oh, or something. Oh, Leanne, Leanne Edelstein. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And, and his wife didn't know that, so she kicked him out. <laughs> So, really? um, even though he was crook and old, she kicked him out after all those years because they've been married since '68. Ah, oh, that's sad. Yeah, and 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 I think when that happened, he uh, it rekindled a lot of um, interest in the man. You know what I mean? Because you know when you're old and all that sort of stuff, you need people looking after you. Yeah. And he wrote a. Oh, I wish I'd brought it in. I was mm. going to read it out, but um, he wrote a poem that New Yorker um, published about death. Right. Um, yeah, it was, it's beautiful, and they've used it on on the net already. They've made the Elysian Fields. Close. <laughs> there you go. Close. How about that? No, I think it's called, named after a flower or something. Right. Anyway. Well, the Elysian Fields is a flower, isn't it? The Elysian. Oh, it's a paddock. Paddock, to old, an Australian, it's a paddock. A stinky old paddock. A paddock. With poop in it, with uh, cow pats. Now, you're um, what you call gilding the lily there. I or, am a little bit. You know why? Because uh, there's a lot of um, 
importance around his mouth. Yeah. When people speak a lot publicly, their, their, their mouth forms a lot of very interesting angles and uh, creases which, uh, um, and wrinkles eventually. Yeah. You know, but um, it means that somebody is tending to either talk a lot or talk not very much. Yeah. Um, here you've got sort of an equal measure of talking and not talking. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of lines that, that indicate thought and uh, not very happy thoughts. There's a lot. There's, I wouldn't be surprised to hear that he suffered from depression because there's a lot of that happening around his eyes and certainly um, this complex um, lattice of, uh, of conflicting uh, creases and things in his Lattice, head. conflicting lattice. Of well, it's sort of, they're not sort of even, right? They're yeah. not like a even, yeah. evenly spaced lines like this, right? And even you can forgive a furrow in the head. That just means yeah. that the the eyebrows that tend to push together over time, they create a furrow. Now he's got two furrows, and the second furrow is broken. So I don't want to sound too much like a palm reader, of like, you know, here is the Mount of Venus, and it tells you we're going to live a long life. And well, it looks, a bit, like, uh, it it looks a bit like geology, you know. <laughs> it's a slipped incline yeah. or something. Well, I, I look at it the same way. It's um, actually a quite a, a important thing to think about. This is... You know, while you're drawing, these are things that come to you and say, why is that like that? Why is that like that? And, of course, it's, um, it's something that uh, comes from observing people as they, um, you know, in, in life and in photographs. It didn't really work, did it, that white? Anyway, um, it's a very nice... Uh, I, I think there's some nice lines there. I quite like the there's way some, that it's There are some nice lines there. I'll agree with you. There's some nice lines there. Mm. So um, this is Clive James. This is... Uh, this is uh, Jim Bridges. And this is Franz Cantor. And when he says you'll see on the flip side, yeah. what he basically means is that... Next picture. The next picture over yeah. here. That's the flip side. That's right. the next picture. And uh, I can actually... Watch, you, hang on, hang on. What can we do next watch time? This space. Yeah, watch this watch space. Watch this space. So tomorrow we've got a very interesting subject for you too, so please tune in and enjoy. Any clues? Any clues? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Oh. Tune in tomorrow. Bye-bye. I know, but I'm not allowed to tell. <laughs>